Hello, welcome to September's Q&A video. Uh, this one's just not going to have a question to you guys. Uh, I honestly couldn't think of anything that was thought-provoking enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really creative when it comes to stuff like that, but I'm trying. Um, before we get started, though, I want to thank you guys for sticking with me, uh, especially if you've uh, subscribed and if you share the videos. Thank you very much. Please continue to do that. Comment below, especially on this view the vehicle <laughs> video with questions for next month. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> I got two questions to follow up on here. So the first one's from DM Dave. It goes like this: a tactical question for you. I have this come up more in Flames of War than anything else. It has a morale system like 40k, like seventh, but uh, where if a unit breaks, it all runs away. Now, I understand that my question is a case by case, but in general, if a unit is probably going to break on a morale check, is it smarter to switch your fire to something else and chance it on a die roll for that unit, that, that unit run away, or just wipe them out and maybe take a hit from a different unit? <clears throat> Dave, that's a good question, but as you know, I can talk for a very long time on tactics. So, but, you know, if you think about it, you, you're right. This is, you know, it is a case by case. However, just like anything in tactics, it always is a case by case. So let's kind of look at the concept here and let's see what we can break it down. Um, if you think about it, there's, you're, you're talking about here is target priority and threat, all right? And to kind of put it into Sun Tzu's words, he would <clears throat> use the concepts or talk about the concepts of, you know, estimating, you know, the, the damage that an opponent's unit can do, that the damage unit can do, and compare that to other threats on the table. Then you have to calculate the chances that it will not run away and continue to be that threat, and then assess the risk of leaving it in place. So the basic calculation uh, and risk assessment things he was talking about, estimation, calculation, risk assessment. So you can do the same thing here. This actually uh, applies to you know 8th edition, uh, bolt action. I uh, believe it also affects uh, AOS, yeah, because it's the same as 8th edition morale. You know, anytime you you deal out enough damage to a unit where it can be affected and either nullified or significantly weakened, this question still applies. Okay, so think about this. If you've done enough damage to a unit to make it, you know, potentially fall back, it's not too hard a calculation to do, to know what are the chances it's going to stay in place. We're only dealing with a D6 here, or maybe two D6, but it, you should be able to generally broadly estimate the chances. You know, you, you look at your your numbers. You know, there's uh, if you have a roll of a, a 1 in 6 chance is 16% or so, 2 in 6 is 33% chance. It's very easy to come up with the numbers. And you don't have to be exact. You just need to be generally correct. Now, 2d6, it's a, not so bad. Uh, so 7 out of 12 is more, a little bit more than 50%. Um, and if you look, you know, it drops down like 40. And, you know, it goes down to, if you think about it, you know, a 3 or less, or 11 and 12, is 1 sixth, right? Is that right? Nope. Nope, sorry. 1, 2, or two 3, or 4, and 10, 11, 12, that, those are all 1 sixth. That's 16%. So, you know, you can gauge the likelihood, relatively speaking, of them staying in place or, or making that morale check you want them to, to fail. So now, given that, you now need to take a look. How much damage can that, what's left of the unit do? If it's a weakened unit, well, is it as much of a threat as it used to be? And then look at the other threats, that are, if you will, the next most dangerous thing on the table the opponent has. Now, if you think about this, this is extremely important to remember. There are other game systems, um, well, I mean, Eighth and AOS, I'm pretty sure, does, does, does do it the same way. The fact that damage can weaken a unit, uh, you know, the larger, uh, higher wound models, you, you want to think in these terms, not just on the morale, but also in this, uh, you know, weakening them, do you want to shift your fire? Uh, I'll put a card up in one of these corners uh, to my 8th edition learning curve on that concept. Uh, to kill or not to kill kind of, kind of question there. Okay, so, remember, uh, threat assessment, uh, the, the relative threat of a unit is not something that stays with it throughout the entire game in most cases. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with Flames of War, uh, it, though I'm interested in trying to learn that. Um, you know, in bolt action, a small unit can, you know, like a team weapon or whatever, can basically, they, they have negative shooting penalties if they've taken a lot of pins 
they're less likely to, to be able to act on an order, right? Uh, <clears throat> if they're smaller, all the units have fewer shots coming out, right? And then those kind of things, you know, the, th the threat of that unit scales down in a lot of cases. So if that's the case, okay, you're, you have to realize that every turn you need to redo a threat assessment. Look at the entire table, reprioritize the most dangerous targets on the table. So you might be shifting your fire quite a bit. That's not a bad thing. Now granted there is a one thing that you need to worry about and that is kill points because often games are decided in their victory conditions based on number of enemy units destroyed. When that's the case, <clears throat> you have to balance threat assessment with dead victory point assessment, right? So in that case, it's extremely important. You pick the right weapon for the job. So when you've got a unit that is healthy and is now a threat, and one that's about to be wiped off the table but could pass that morale check, don't hit. You, you don't want to necessarily focus on that with weapons that are better suited for the other threat that is the, basically the next in line or the one that has now become the most important on the table. So in the end, make the assessment, like you said, on a case-by-case -case basis based on what is the likelihood that, that unit will, number one, stay around and be a greater, the greatest threat on the table. If it's not the greatest threat, you probably want to shift your fire. So those are my two cents now, like I said, case by case, but that's a pretty good, I think, good guideline uh, in general. All right, so thanks, Dave, for that question. And the next one is from Eating Beer. Let's see what he has to say. Are there any painting techniques you feel like you're nearly at the level you want to be with a little more practice? It's a good question, but it's not as easy to answer because I don't really like to... Uh, I don't like to say if I'm good at something or not, right? Um, but... Let's go, I'll go this far. When I first read this question, uh, the very first thing that popped to my mind, spray priming. <laughs> okay. But uh, it's, it's not really what, uh, you know, a, a real good answer at all. I think if I had to look at it, the there's only really one technique that I think I'm anywhere near uh, what I would consider good at. Uh, and that actually is using an airbrush for uh, weathering. The, using an airbrush... There's a lot of you know a lot of reasons to use it. There's a certain type of weathering uh, that you can apply with an airbrush that's mostly around uh, dust and uh, airborne grime. And so, you know, it's something that you can really apply well with the airbrush because with that effect, you know, that type of uh, weathering applies very very faintly and. It's almost a, a fogging or a ghosting on the on the object. If you ever taken a look at a dust covered, uh, it, well, anything you know that's look at cars that have you know picked up road grime along their lower half. Okay, uh, I'm not talking about off road vehicles that are mud plastered. <laughs> that really is just a base coating there. Um, but if you think about uh, looking at when you've got a lot of uh, particulate matter in the air, dust or whatever. I don't know if you guys have been around uh, where there's been wildfires or uh, ash coming down. You'll get, on the tops of things, you'll get a light dusting. And you'll see that it doesn't, it, it's not like, it doesn't blanket it as far as cover the color. It changes the color with and it, by overlaying it with this really thin coat of the color of whatever the material is, right? And that's dust on the side of vehicles, that's grime on the side of vehicles, that's uh, uh, ash and dust that's come down. And that can be really well applied by an airbrush because you can get that very thin overspray that you're looking for. And <clears throat> the reason I think I'm, uh, I'm at the level where I'm just about got it is because for years that I used to be asked to do weathering on models. Uh, I, in the my model railroad hobby in the background there, I would often be asked and commissioned to do weathering jobs for people because I had gotten so good at it. So that's what I'm going to be uh, calling a uh, a painting technique. It's airbrush weathering. Okay. So I hope that answers your questions. Uh, please feel free to comment below for next month's, and we'll see where we go with this. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.